for him to witness the uh, death and also the, uh, the uh, uh, terrible torture of, uh, of Christians. And he was shaken by what he saw. He, he later described it in these words. He said, every man who sees it is moved with some misgiving and is set on fire to learn the reason. And I think by that he means the reason for their faith, their willingness to die, and also the uh, courage with which they met death. He inquires and he is taught, and when he has learned the truth, he instantly follows it himself. Well, at least Tertullian did. He became a, a, a Christian, a very influential Christian in this uh, early era of the, uh, of the church. And one of the things he said, which is uh, famous, well-known, and often quoted, is that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. He believed it was their stalwart courage in the face of opposition and persecution which created interest in their faith and which in the long run won many people to Christ. In the uh, New Testament, in the book of Acts, the persecution we witness in the early days of Christianity was primarily Jewish persecution. In the, uh, in the book of Acts, we find uh, uh, the apostles and others being persecuted by the uh, Jewish leaders uh, because they preached uh, Jesus Christ and because they insisted upon His resurrection. And um, repeatedly they found themselves at odds with the Jewish authorities. In the book of Acts, there are five main waves of Jewish persecution. The first wave takes place... In Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John healed a lame man at the beautiful gate, when a crowd gathers, Peter preached, they are arrested and uh, threatened. The uh, second wave of persecution seems to come not long after that, when all of the apostles were arrested. You remember they were jailed and flogged by the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 5. And then in Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, we find Stephen being stoned, and then it talks about Saul making havoc, in the King James Version, havoc is the old Anglo-Saxon word for hawk, uh, like a hawk, uh, he tore the uh, church to pieces, uh, that would be the uh, third wave of persecution, and then the fourth wave is reported in um, Acts chapter 12, when we read about James, the brother of John, being beheaded, by King Herod Agrippa I. Now Herod Agrippa is interesting in that he is actually both a Roman and Jewish official. Uh, he is the grandson of Herod the Great. Uh, Herod the Great, of course, had no Jewish blood in him, but he married uh, a, a Jewish wife, uh, Mary Amni, and so his sons and grandsons had, were, uh, were part Jew. Herod Agrippa I is actually a client king of the Romans, and thinks of himself as a Roman, but it's very specific in saying that uh, he saw that when he beheaded James, it pleased the Jews. And, and so obviously, this is not something he's doing as a Roman official, but as the uh, king of the, uh, of the Jews in Jerusalem. He also intends to execute Peter, and you're very familiar with the story of how Peter was delivered uh, miraculously by an angel. Well, the fifth wave of, of, of persecution has to do with the Apostle Paul. Basically, we find Paul being opposed by certain Asian Jews who, who come to Jerusalem, stirring up trouble. First of all, they try just to kill him with mob violence when a Roman official intervenes. Then they make a secret pact to assassinate him. And when word of that leaks out and uh, Peter is excuse me, Paul is transferred to a Caesarea. Then they try to use the Roman court system to judicially murder Paul. And of course, eventually Paul is forced to make his appeal to Caesar. So you have five waves of persecution. Interestingly, in the book of Acts, the Romans are not presented as persecutors of the church. In fact, in, and I mentioned this earlier, in almost every instance we encounter the Romans um, they seem to be men who are trying to, uh, to maintain order. And uh, generally, uh, their interactions with Christians are to the benefit of 
the church and uh, the missionary efforts of, uh, of Christians. Well, we uh, noted last week that um, the last time we encounter most of the apostles is in Acts chapter 1 and verse 2, uh, when the successor is chosen to uh, Judas in Acts 1 and then preaching on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Um, we also talked about the fact that there is substantially good evidence for what happened to the apostles. Now, it's not necessarily the stories that you read in popular accounts because a lot about their lives has been mythologized by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church tries to uh, concoct stories about them to establish and bolster their claims uh, and to, uh, in various ways, uh, uh, further their own purposes. But there are some primary sources who give us good information about the life and death of the apostles. We mentioned Papias last week. Papias was a man who lived in the last years of the apostle John. He claimed to have known John and to have studied at the feet of John. Papias became an elder, a bishop in the church at Heriopolis. Heriopolis uh, is in that same area of Asia Minor where uh, Colossae and Laodicea were. And uh, it was an important town. Uh, it was also a uh, spa, kind of a place where a lot of people came. And so Papias says that he made it his occupation to talk to all of the uh, first generation Christians that he could meet who were still alive and, uh, and obtain their evidence and their information. Among the people that he knew, he says, were the uh, daughters of the evangelist Philip. Uh, from, the, uh, from the book of Acts, who uh, in their later years moved to Heriopolis. And so he claims to have found them to be a wealth of information about the, uh, the original generation of the apostles. Um, also, we noted uh, there was a Jewish convert to Christianity by the name of Hegesippius. He lived 110 to 180 A.D. And then Irenaeus, who was a student of Polycarp, uh, Polycarp was another man who was a student of John. Polycarp knew John well. Uh, Polycarp came from Smyrna, one of the seven churches of Asia. He was an elder in the church there. And um, Irenaeus through Polycarp uh, learned a great deal about the history of the apostles. And he was also acquainted with Papias. And, and then we talked about <clears throat> uh, two other men from that era who uh, uh, had good sources and good background information. One of them is Hippolytus, who was a Roman. He was a study, a study, a student of Irenaeus. Uh, and he was himself a martyr. He was dragged to death by wild horses in 235 AD. Uh, he knew a great deal about things that went on around Rome, um, in the uh, church at Rome before his time and during. And then there was Eusebius. Eusebius is the father of church history. Uh, Eusebius lived in Antioch and in Caesarea. He spent time in Jerusalem. Uh, he made it his work to collect all the information he could from whatever sources, preserve and set them down. And so a lot of the information we have from some of these other men, for example, Papias, comes from quotations from their works in the uh, church history of Eusebius. Okay, so having pointed out these men as uh, bona fide sources and um, Christians who uh, many of them uh, suffered for their faith, uh, some of them died for their faith, uh, they would seem to be uh, good primary sources for what happened to the apostles. All right, according to these five men, here's what we know. We know everything about James the son of Zebedee, brother of John, because we're told that he was uh, the first to be martyred, Acts chapter 12. Uh, he was beheaded in Jerusalem. Interesting that he wasn't crucified, but the Bible says specifically beheaded. Normally, beheading was a uh, punishment uh, reserved. It was an honor and a, a, a kind of a concession to Roman citizens. Generally, non-Romans were crucified. Uh, Herod Agrippa I, the father of King Agrippa that uh, set in judgment of Paul later on, 
is the one who was responsible for his death. Now that brings us to Simon Peter, who is very prominent in the first half of the book of Acts, or at, like, at least the first 12 chapters of Acts. Pretty much the first 12 chapters are an account of the, uh, of the work of Peter primarily. Um, Peter preached in Jerusalem. We know that he went to Caesarea. The Apostle Paul tells us that. We, we also know that, um, I mean, the book of uh, Acts tells us that, excuse me, Luke tells us that. We also know that he went to uh, Antioch because the Apostle Paul tells us that. Uh, he wrote the book of 1 Peter. And in that book, he says he's writing from Babylon, which is kind of an interesting expression. And uh, there's debate among serious scholars as to what he actually meant. Since in the first century, there was no, uh, there was no city in Babylon. Uh, remember, the uh, prophets had predicted that Babylon would become a desolation and a ruin, and there was no New Testament city on the site of Babylon. Most scholars believe that it is a veiled reference to Rome, and that perhaps Peter is writing from Rome. It's interesting that these early sources believe uh, that Peter made it to Rome, according to Hippolytus. Remember, he was the one who was from Rome. He says that Peter also preached in Pontus, that's Asia Minor, and then in Galatia, that's Asia Minor, Cappadocia, Batania, Asia, all of those are in Asia Minor, and that he preached in Italy after he came as a prisoner to Rome. And then he says, and he's also uh, seconded by Hegesippus, that uh, he was crucified in Rome when Nero was emperor, and that because he felt himself unworthy to be crucified as the Lord was, he, uh, he asked to be crucified upside down, and uh, he was allowed to die in that way. Philip, the apostle, according to um, early accounts, uh, also preached in Asia Minor. Um, he went to Heriopolis himself. Um, and while he was there, this is the first evidence we have of Roman persecution outside of Nero himself. While he was at Heriopolis, he converted the wife of the Roman proconsul. The Roman proconsul was so enraged that he had Philip nailed upside down to a tree by his feet and then had him beheaded while hanging upside down. Uh, the ruins at Heriopolis are substantial and significant. Uh, this is what's called Domitian's Gate. Uh, Domitian did a lot to uh, build and beautify the, uh, the city of Heriopolis. Uh, here's another... Um, picture of excavations from Heriopolis. Now I mentioned earlier that this city was kind of a spa and this is why. The water there was very warm. It was like hot springs or you know any of those uh, type of places which historically uh, people have resorted to for, uh, for medicinal purposes. And the water was full of minerals and you can see these terraces at Heriopolis. Uh, the name for it today in Turkey is, uh, is Pamukkale. Uh, but uh, you can see how the lime and the other minerals of this water has settled out and they have these terraces and people go and they, they bathe in this area. And this was going on in the first century. Uh, and so wealthy people from Asia Minor and beyond would, uh, would go to this place to be uh, healed of, uh, of whatever was ailing them. An interesting thing that you may or may not have seen is uh, this story that appeared in the news quite recently. The archaeologists believe that they have discovered Philip's tomb at Heriopolis. Uh, here you see excavation work um, going on. They're continuing the excavation of the city, and they found uh, a church building which seemed to uh, indicate by ancient uh, uh, signs, uh, graffiti on the walls, that uh, it housed the, uh, the tomb of Philip. And so after dissembling the building, the archaeologists believe that they found the actual tomb of Philip, uh, Philip. On July the 27th, 2011, Italian archaeologist Francesco de Andrea reported the uh, discovery of the tomb of St. Philip during excavations near the Turkish city of uh, Denizli. Professor de Andrea discovered the tomb within a newly revealed 5th century church at Hier Hieriopolis. And so apparently, 
uh, based on archaeological evidence, they believe that they have found an original first century tomb. And that uh, indications from graffiti and uh, in other ways indicate that it was held to be the tomb of Philip in the first century. Well, Matthew. Uh, according to early accounts, Matthew preached in Asia Minor, uh, as most of the apostles did. According to Hippolytus, uh, Matthew wrote his gospel in Hebrew. Hippolytus is the source of the idea that Matthew originally wrote, not in Greek, but in Hebrew, and then that Matthew himself translated what he had written in Hebrew into, uh, into Greek. Uh, Hippolytus says that he uh, wrote his gospel and published it first at Jerusalem. Uh, and by published, of course, he just means made it available and circulated it. Afterward, he went as a missionary to the Persians, the Parthians, and the Medes. According to um, early accounts, he was slain with a halberd in what today we would call Iran, would have been Persia in those days. I have an old picture which shows you a, a halberd. I don't know if you can see it or not. A halberd is the man on the left right here is getting ready to chop his head off. A halberd is an axe, basically, uh, a war axe. And supposedly he was beheaded with this, uh, with this war axe. Well, uh, that brings us then to uh, James the Less. Uh, James the Less, the son of Alphaeus. According to Hippolytus, uh, he died in Jerusalem. He was thrown from the walls of the temple to the ground, uh, severely injured but not killed. And so then they uh, began to stone him. And uh, when he took longer to die than uh, they were happy with, they uh, beat his brains out with a fuller's club. A, uh, a fuller is one who uh, makes white garments, uh, you know, who... Um, bleaches white garments, and they would use a club to, uh, to pound them with. Uh, and according to Hippolytus, he was buried beside the uh, walls of the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, here's an artist's representation of James, and he's holding the, uh, the Fuller's Club. Matthias... We know less about Matthias than any of the other apostles because uh, we don't meet him until Acts chapter 1, and then we don't read anything else about him after that. Uh, we know little about where he went, but according to a Greek historian by the name of Nicephorus, and uh, Nicephorus uh, did not live until the 3rd century, so these, uh, this account is not as old as the other ones we're looking at. But he preached in the area around the Caspian Sea, and um, then he was martyred in today what we would call Georgia and buried in the city of Gonio. And in fact, in the fortress of Gonio today, uh, there is a tomb which, uh, according to local uh, belief, is the, uh, the tomb of Matthias. Uh, it's never been examined archaeologically because the, uh, the government refuses uh, to allow any, uh, any examination to, uh, to be made. Uh, so not much in the way of confirmation of the end of, uh, of Matthias. And then there is Andrew. Uh, Origen says that Andrew preached along the Black Sea, and then he preached among the Scythians and the Thracians. Uh, um, that would be in the Caucasus region of what today is Russia. Uh, that he preached as far as the Volga River, uh, which is interesting because, of course, the uh, the Volga runs close to, uh, to Moscow, runs through the city of Tuvir, where Mary and I uh, worked for about, uh, about um, nine different summers in, in years past. Uh, the, uh, the Volga ran through uh, Tuvir. It was a huge river there. Uh, but that he preached up and down the, uh, the river, and also that he preached in Kiev in Novgorod. He was crucified at Patras, which was a town in Achaia, Greece, uh, he was crucified in an olive tree, according to Origen, on an X-shaped cross. And so when you hear people refer to the cross of Andrew, uh, they're talking about a, a, a cross like this one. Now, if Origen's right, the cross was, was set in a tree and was nailed to a tree, and then he was, uh, was crucified there. Judas... The, uh, the son of James, who's also called Lebius 
or Thaddeus among the apostles. According to Hippolytus, Judas preached in Syria, Persia, Mesopotamia. And then while preaching in Armenia, Armenia would be the far eastern part of modern Turkey. Uh, The uh, Turks basically uh, massacred the Armenians back in the early 20th century. He converted the daughter of the pagan king of that area. Uh, The king was enraged. He threatened his daughter with death if she did not renounce Christianity. He basically gave her the choice of renouncing Christianity and once again becoming a princess or dying. Uh, She remained steadfast in her faith. She chose death. And so he killed her along with Judas and uh, a number of other people who had been converted by his preaching Uh, in that particular place, and according to Hippolytus, this was in 66 A.D., about the same time that uh, Paul was uh, was executed in Rome. And then next there is Bartholomew, also called Nathaniel. Eusebius says that Bartholomew went as a missionary all the way to India, where he left a copy of Matthew's Gospel. He also traveled to um, Parthia, Lacania and Armenia, areas in the uh, eastern part of Asia Minor and then on into what would be uh, Persia. At uh, Baku on the Caspian Sea, he converted the brother of the pagan, the pagan king there whose name was Astigius. Uh, this was in 71 AD. And uh, as a result of that, Astigius ordered Bartholomew to be flayed alive, that is skinned. And then after he was skinned, he was uh, crucified. Um, For centuries, there was a a tomb, which was held to be the tomb of uh, of Bartholomew. Uh, In the Middle Ages, a monastery was built over it. This is the last picture of it taken in 1948. After that, uh, it was destroyed by Muslims, Turks, and uh, they reduced the whole thing to uh, ashes and, uh, and dust. Uh, nothing, nothing at all remains of the, uh, of the site. Thomas. Uh, Hippolytus records that uh, Thomas went as a missionary to the Parthians and the Medes, the Persians, uh, various tribes to the east, uh, and then that he also went to India where he met his death. Uh, he was according to the record, thrust through repeatedly with a lance or a spear at uh, Kalamini, which is in Madras, India. And uh, here's an artist's representation of uh, him being repeatedly speared uh, to death. And then Simon, called Simon the Canaan or Simon the Zealot, um, is reported to have preached in Egypt. Uh, He went south. Uh, after preaching in Egypt, then he went across the north coast of North Africa and then uh, crossed over the Mediterranean uh, into Spain through Gaul. And according to the ancient historical records, he went as far as Britain. And of course, um, um, there is a, 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 a very old tradition that he was martyred in Castor. Uh, Castor was a Roman town in Britain and that he was killed by being sawn asunder. And so a lot of times when you see representations of Simon, you'll see him holding the uh, the sword with which he was slain. Uh, You see one of these statues, uh, not a sword, but a saw, excuse me, with which he was slain. If you see one holding a sword, that's always Paul. And if you see one holding keys, that's always Peter. The uh, artists kind of follow those, uh, those conventions. Well, there's John, the last of the twelve. It was the unanimous view of all of these early writers that John was the last apostle to die. Uh, There's good historical evidence that John preached in Antioch and in Asia Minor, especially around Ephesus, that he spent a great deal of time in Ephesus. There's a lot of evidence for that. Um, You remember after the resurrection when Jesus met his apostles in Galilee uh, and uh, Jesus was talking to Peter and Peter asked him what was going to become of John and Jesus said, if, I, if it's my will that he remain till I come again, what is that to you? 
And so it says in verse 21, So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? There have been a number of false teachers across the uh, ages who have taken the position that John didn't die. And in fact, it is the official doctrine of the Mormon church that John did not die, that he appeared in 1829 to Joseph Smith in order to restore the apostolic succession, the succession of the apostles to earth in the person of Joseph Smith. And Mormons say that the apostle John is living somewhere on this earth alive today and will continue to do so until Christ comes again. In reality, the early Christian writers, as well as the Bible, insist that John was banished to the island of Patmos, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. That is the island of Patmos. Uh, here's the, uh, the main city of, uh, of uh, Patmos. Um, this is the grotto of John the Evangelist. Mary and I were able to, uh, to go there. And this is the inside where I took an unlawful picture and almost got arrested. Um, but it was a cave, and the, the ancient tradition is that, uh, that during the time he was on the island of Patmos, John lived there. Uh, down on the uh, beach, uh, they have this site. There's a, uh, it is the baptistry of John. It was a baptistry for immersion. They say that while he was there as a prisoner, that he converted many of the uh, natives of that island and baptized them. We believe that he was released from his exile and eventually returned to Ephesus. Uh, Constantine built this church building, the uh, Church of St. John the uh, Divine, he calls it, in uh, Ephesus in honor of John. And supposedly, it holds the tomb of the, uh, of the remains of John, buried somewhere uh, beneath the foundations of the, uh, of the church itself. Well, the Apostle Paul was the special apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, the last half of the book of Acts is taken up primarily with his travels. He suffered persecution. Uh, he suffered opposition uh, in so many different ways. We know that he was imprisoned as the book of Acts ended. It's uh, the unanimous uh, belief of these early writers that Paul was released after that first imprisonment, as indeed he expected to be when he wrote the book of 1 Timothy. And according to Papias... The oldest of those men, uh, of the, the earliest of those men, I should have said, Paul preached all the way to the furthest reaches of the West. Now that's kind of an ambiguous statement. We know that Paul wanted to go to Spain. He says that in his epistle to the Romans. Uh, there is some evidence that he was able to accomplish that journey after he was released, that he not only went to Spain, but also went north into Gaul, and uh, there is quite a lot of belief among scholars uh, that he may have crossed the English Channel into, uh, into Britain. Uh, and of course in London, the, uh, the greatest church there is St. Paul's. And there is the belief that that's the point he reached uh, when Paul was traveling in Britain. Uh, I think that is not impossible. I don't say that it's likely, but I think it could have happened because we just don't know exactly what Papias meant when he said the furthest reaches of the West. We know that in the first century, Britain was firmly a part of the Roman Empire and uh, that uh, it would have been, uh, been included in discussions of, uh, of how far Roman authority reached. Well, we believe that Paul was rearrested, uh, taken to Rome, and executed sometime around 66 AD. In Rome, this is the uh, entrance to the Mamertine prison. The Mamertine prison is a first century site. It was the place where uh, prisoners of the uh, uh, Roman imperial, uh, Imperium were, uh, were housed. Um, uh, these are the uh, steps going down into the dungeons be below. Uh, although there's some evidence that those steps may have been added later in the first century and that prisoners were lowered down through a hole in the ceiling which is, uh, is still there. And then you have these, these cells below 
which uh, would have been the place where Paul would have, uh, would have been in prison. Uh, you can see why when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, that he wanted him to bring his overcoat from, uh, from um, um, Troas, uh, which, he had, which he had left there. Uh, it would have been a cold, damp place. Uh, <clears throat> this is the church of St. Paul's, Paul's Basilica outside the walls of Rome. Paul was executed outside the city. He was beheaded, as was his right as a Roman citizen. Uh, executions always took place outside the city. And it's believed that this is the place where he was executed and uh, where he was buried. When Constantine began to promote Christianity in the empire, 315 A.D., Constantine went to find the, uh, the uh, sepulcher of Paul. He had it excavated, and he claims that it was at this spot. Uh, he found this, uh, marking a tomb. And you can see it says, Paul the Apostle. It's in Latin. Uh, uh, Paul... Um, died in Rome, so it's not impossible that the inscription would have been in Latin, although at the time inscriptions tended to be in, uh, in Greek, uh, even in the, uh, in the city of Rome. But it says, Paul the Apostle. Uh, Constantine found that inscription, and so he believed that he had found the bones, and so he built this church to house them. Uh, this is what it looks like on the inside. It's been built and rebuilt across the centuries. Way down front is the altar. I've drawn a circle around it. And supposedly, it's built over the tomb of Paul. And if you go down to it, um, you kind of see that open work in the, uh, in the altar there where you can look through and see part of the sepulcher. And then they've got a piece of glass, plexiglass, I guess, in the floor. And you can stand on it and look down below at what is supposed to be the, te- the tomb of Paul. Up on top, you see a little lit thing that looks, al- looks almost like a computer monitor, this is what it is. Uh, they claim that this chain was found in the grave with the bones in the, uh, in the sepulcher. And archaeologists do believe that it is, the, uh, it is a, a first century type of chain, the sort of thing that would have been used in the Roman Empire at the time. Whether these are Paul's remains, whether this is his chain, uh, we really have no idea. And then it gets kind of to the ridiculous because they have all of these reliquaries which supposedly contain fragments of Paul's bones and which decorate all around the, uh, the altar. All those little golden cases house something. A finger, you can see the one in the center, has the top of his skull. But those are all parts of, uh, of remains of the Apostle Paul. Well, it looks like that our, uh, our time is pretty well gone. Uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the emperors and their persecution of Christianity. And so we'll, we'll let that hang over till next time. Uh, next time I want to talk about the, um, some of the not only outward stresses against the uh, church, the uh, persecution from without, but also some of the uh, heresies, the false doctrines that began to arise from within. So we'll, uh, uh, Lord willing, we'll, uh, we'll turn to that next week. Uh, Nero, we believe, is the first emperor who officially persecuted Christians. Um, uh, Nero, of course, was an extravagant, immoral tyrant. Uh, Nero is about as um, uh, despicable a human being as ever ever existed. Uh, um, He murdered his father-in-law. He uh, divorced his first wife. Uh, Nero was twice married in public ceremonies to men. He was a a flagrant homosexual. His second wife, uh, he kicked to death when she was seven months pregnant. He murdered his mother. He uh, murdered the emperor, his step-grandfather, in order to to take his place. Uh, And so he was a man of uh, absolutely... uh, uh, depraved morality. Uh, basically, he began to persecute Christians, not because he had anything against them, but because he wanted to build an extravagant new palace in Rome. And uh, the place he chose for the palace 
was one of the uh, largest slums in Rome, and he wanted it cleared. And so apparently, uh, he set fire to that part of the city. The fire got out of hand, and it burned most of Rome. Uh, you've heard the old expression, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Um, early Roman writers, like Suetonius, absolutely believe that Nero uh, may have set the fire with his own hands, and if he didn't, he caused it to be set. Um, he wasn't prepared for the outcry of anguished indignation. And so uh, when people began to accuse him of having done this horrendous thing, he looked for a scapegoat. And the uh, Christians were convenient. Uh, they talked about judgment and, uh, and uh, the uh, fires of eternal punishment. And so he was able to... Uh, shunt his uh, guilt off onto them, and he began to uh, brutally persecute Christians in, in ways that uh, were undreamt of. Uh, he would sew Christians up in the uh, skins of wild animals and throw them into the arena to be torn apart by wild dogs. He would s uh, s douse Christians with pitch and then impale them on poles and set them afire as n lights to a... Um, light the palace grounds when he threw a great banquet at night. Um, he, he killed Christians in terrible, horrible, horrendous ways. And that really was the opening overture in the uh, almost two centuries of persecution of Christians which was to follow. We'll talk more about that, Lord willing, next week. And then we'll get into a discussion of the, uh, the errors and false doctrines which emerged uh, in that era and in the years to follow.
Good evening. I think it's about time for us to uh, begin our midweek devotional. Thank you for coming out. We appreciate your attendance. We got a lot of crew up uh, just north of us a little bit, so our numbers are a little down. Tonight, uh, Derek Coleman is going to lead us in our singing. Uh, Craig Laird will word our first prayer. Mark Edwards will close us, close us out in prayer, and uh, Alan Cohorn will give the devotional thought. The ladies, all of you are invited to a lunch. That's going to be on Tuesday. It's 11:30. That's out in Farmington at the Briar, at the uh, Briar Rose. Uh, so you're invited to come and eat, meet and eat. It says. Also, uh, don't forget that the week of the July 4th, instead of having our midweek service on the 4th, we will have it on Tuesday the 3rd. It'll be at the same time, 7 p.m. And uh, statewide mission is set. Please mark it on your calendar, July 13, 14, and 15. That'll be down in Moralton. And uh, workers of all skill levels are needed, so check with Kobe uh, Davis for more information. Uh, out here across from the elevator, we got a whole lot of lost or left items, uh, Bibles, dishes, and those kinds of things. Check it and see if any of it is yours. And if it's still there, you might need to take it home. <laughs> okay? But we'd appreciate you doing that. Also, keep Barbara Dockery in your prayers. Uh, her sister, Darlene Taylor, has been uh, placed under hospice care. And uh, so please keep that family in our prayers as uh, she's dealing with this. Are there any other announcements? Derek? If you'd like to mark your songbooks, the Song of Invitation tonight is song number 655. Song number 655. After that, would you please turn to song number 511? Song number 511. After this song, we'll have our opening prayer and then the devotional. Oft we come together, oft we sing and pray. Here we bring our offering on this holy Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time to come together tonight to assemble freely. We thank you, Father, for this place of worship. We thank you, Father, for this country we live in and for all the freedoms that we have and for the way that you bless us. Father, we thank you for the health that you've given us that we can, we can be here tonight. And we thank you, Father, for our families, for our spouses, our children, our grandchildren. 
for all of our all of our friends and, and especially father we're thankful for this for this family here at center street father we thank you for brother bobby and uh the ability that you've blessed him with and his willingness to come and, and uh, impart knowledge and help us uh, in, this, in this summer study. Father, we uh, want to ask a special blessing on our young people that are at camp this week. We pray that you'll keep them safe and, and we pray that it will be a time of spiritual growth. We pray that you'll be with all of our many members who are out there worshiping tonight, that you will keep them safe as they uh, travel back this evening. Father, we ask that you be with Barbara's sister, we pray that you will help her and help the doctors that are taking care of her and just encourage that family. Father, be with Olivia Carson. We pray, Father, for healing. We pray for your intervention in, in, on her behalf. And we pray, Father, that you will encourage her and, and uh, lift up her family, Chris and Kathy. We just pray that you will just bless them, Father, and just intervene and uh, give her restoration of her health. Father, we uh, pray that you'll be with David. Stebbins, we pray that you will give him better health and, and, and uh, good results. Father, continue to bless Donna Norsworthy and her family over the loss of her brother-in-law and also uh, bless the rest of her family who has health issues as well. Father, uh, we thank you for Alan and his ability to speak and, and to bring us a, the devotional tonight. We pray that you will bless him and, and uh, help us to be good listeners. And Father, we pray that we will use the things we've learned tonight and that and that we will learn to, to apply to our lives and to be what you want us to be. Father, forgive us of our many sins, and we pray that you will help us to be better each day. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I'm actually substituting for Trey Schaffner tonight. He went further north than just Rogers since he's in Omaha, supposedly. So he's probably all wet tonight, but pretty happy. Um, last Sunday evening, I was to do the devotional at the end of, of that uh, worship period, and, um, and we talked about study of Leviticus and all of, the, um, all of the sacrifices that they were asked to give and the way they were asked to give them with the help of the priest. And I really uh, want to briefly tonight talk about a similar, uh, that same topic in a little different way. As Christians, we are trying to get sin out of our life. According to 1 John chapter 1, we are striving to uh, walk in the light as he is in the light and uh, allow the blood of Christ to cleanse us from all sin. And that's a wonderful promise, a wonderful blessing, uh, something to rejoice about and to strive to live so that it applies to you and to me. Um, the, one of the questions in the uh, first five, of course, the, the Old Testament begins to teach us about what sin is, how serious it is, how it separates us from God, and, uh, and all of the uh, exercises they went through to try to please God uh, because of sin. Uh, but those first five offerings which, as you recall, were the uh, whole burn offering, the grain offering, the peace uh, fellowship offering, and then a sin offering, and the guilt reparation offering, which are all covered in the first six verses of Le first six chapters of Leviticus. Um, one of the questions that uh, is striking about that that some of the commentators do is that it talks about the uh, the possibility of sinning. Um, unintentionally, sinning unintentionally. I think most of us view our own sins as not being sins unintentionally. But that's a big issue, and in fact, a debate in some of the uh, readings I've done uh, about whether it was really very much concerned about, about uh, forgiveness of sin, but uh, forgiveness of open sin. And, uh, and yet... It is. So I want to share, first of all, Numbers 15, 21 to 30, 27 to 31. If one person sins unintentionally, he shall offer a female goat a year old for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who makes a mistake when he sins unintentionally to make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. You shall have 
You shall have one law for him who does not does anything unintentionally for him who is native among the people of Israel, and thirdly, for the stranger who sojourns, sojourns among them. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people, because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be utterly cut off, his iniquity shall be before him. Someone made a list of seven ways that the Jews risk unintentionally sinning. Um, Again, I don't think I agree with all of these, but I thought they were interesting for us to consider in our devotional tonight. The idea being sometimes we blame something else on our sins, right? One of our big problems, one of the things that the devil wants us to do is to convince ourselves that it wasn't our fault, that our sins are really not ours, that they're somebody else's, or they're caused by some other things. But in uh, Leviticus 4, uh, when we, one, the first one that he mentions is when we cross an unrecognized boundary. Of course, there were so many laws in the law of Moses that uh, it was easy to not understand them all, and it took a while to learn them, and it was uh, quite an exercise doing that. But starting with verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally in any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and commits any of them, if the appointed priest sins so as to bring guilt on the people, let them offer to the Lord a bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. The second one is when we run with the herd. Sometimes we don't think of the fact that as a congregation, as a group, we can sin. But of course we know, reading Revelation 2 and 3 about the seven churches, that they were, um, as a group, pictured in the New Testament. So this should not be a big surprise to us. But if the whole congregation, starting with verse 13, of Israel commits error and the matter escapes the notice of the assembly and they commit any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and they become guilty, when the sin which they have committed becomes known, the assembly shall offer a bull of the herd for a sin offering and bring it before the tent of meeting. We also know in last Sunday's Bible school, we talked about the uh, scapegoat, the, uh, the uh, Day of Atonement and the scapegoat and the way that once a year the priest had to get the sins out of the camp uh, and then they had to repeat it again the very next year. And then, of course, Hebrews tells us that Jesus died for us once and for all so that we can be continually cleansed of our sin if we are in Christ. And faithful. When a, the third one is when we think our responsibility exempts us. So do you ever think that you're above the commandments or that you have a responsibility that exempts you? The verse is 24, 22 to 24, when a leader sins and unintentionally does any one of all the things which the Lord as God has commanded not to be done and he becomes guilty, Um, If his sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring his offering a goat, a male without defect, and so forth. Um, Hosea, if you're doing your daily Bible readings and you're in the middle of Hosea right now, chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, talks about a guy who got rich by having false weights, and he said he was so rich that he couldn't be... um, that he would never be basically brought to bear for his sin of having, of having unjust weights. In other words, he was a false businessman. He was cheating his customers, and he was getting rich off of it, but he was not liable for his sin. Um, and since our time is running out really fast, I think I'll stop with those three. But there is a lot of us who would like to try to uh, think that maybe we're ignorant of the law or that we are 
uh, sinning unknowingly, but we need to be really careful when we make that judgment, and we need to really watch the reasons that we use to ourselves that everything is okay, that God understands, and that we have no responsibility for those sins. We still need to be striving to get sin out of our lives. If you have a need before the congregation, please make that known as we sing our invitation song, and uh, we would be happy to assist you in whatever need that you have. Please come as we sing. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste away to its spring. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you. Announcements. If not, uh, let's sing the first verse of song number 350. Song number 350. After this, we'll be dismissed in prayer. 350. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. Leads me safely through the sinking sand, it is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best I can. For I need thy light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. Through this pilgrim land, protect me.
Let's pray. Father, we come before your throne once again, uh, thanking you for this time that we've had to be able to, to come here together tonight as your children and uh, to study your word. Father, we're thankful for uh, Alan's message this evening. And Father, help us to always be aware and to remember that whether our sin is unintentional or intentional, that it can separate us from you. Uh, help us, Father, to uh, always repent of those sins and to make things right with you. But most importantly, Father, we're so thankful for the fact that we have Jesus that uh, hides our sins from you and, and uh, um, that we're not like um, those of the Old Testament and under the, the, the law of Moses and the Levitical sacrificial system, uh, that we just had your son, the perfect sacrifice that died on the cross for the remission of our sins. Father, we're thankful for the rain that we've had today and and that we, we pray uh, that there would be more to come soon. Uh, Father, be with us as we leave here tonight. Um, we pray for our safety. We pray for our number that's at Green Valley and for their safety as well. And Father, uh, just help us to always remember who we are and that when, uh, whenever confronted by others, that they would be able to see you in us. And we ask this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>